Welcome to the History of the Cold War podcast, Episode 1, The Ideological Roots of the Cold War. So today, to start, I'm going to examine the ideological outlines of the Cold War. The Cold War represented the pinnacle of an ideological conflict that grew out of the 18th and 19th centuries. I know many of you are asking, wait, what, wasn't the Cold War about freedom and democracy versus the totalitarian communism? And my answer is yes, on a super simplified level, if, say, you're studying the conflict in regards to a U.S. history course. But in this podcast, we're going to dig much deeper into the philosophical ramifications of the conflict and what caused the Cold War. On an ideological level, the Cold War was born out of modernity. Modernity is a period of time, roughly speaking, from the period of the late 18th century through the 20th century, which encompassed two driving forces, the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. These twin forces radically transformed the pre-modern world, changing both the material and intellectual condition of humanity. The Enlightenment gave rise to concepts of individual rights, freedom, liberty, rationalization, urbanization, secularization, the nation-state, and many more we take for granted today that reshaped the way people thought about themselves and others. This should be viewed in contrast to the pre-modern or medieval period. During much of this period, feudalism reigned. Most people lived in some type of fealty or loyalty to some lord or church official. Religion played a much greater role in shaping society and life. Most people had very little individual freedom and lived and worked in an agrarian society. The Enlightenment also saw the way societies were organized challenged, giving birth to modern democratic government and bureaucracy. Rational self-government and efficiency were emphasized over concepts such as divine right and autocracy. The concept of the nation-state came to the fore as well. The nation was a mythical belief in a homogeneous people occupying a specific territory with a shared history, culture, and language, putting multicultural empires like Austria and Tsarist Russia under strain as many of their minority peoples sought independence as they identified with their new nation rather than the empire. Moreover, the French Revolution and later ideologies such as Marxism and fascism no longer sought just to rule people. They sought to fundamentally change them. The French First Republic under Robespierre tried to change man himself. They attempted to do away with religion. They introduced mass conscription, or levy en masse, changing the face of warfare. They introduced a new calendar system and a 10-day week. The later ideologies of socialism and fascism sought to gain greater control of people's lives. These ideologies sought to fundamentally change the people they ruled, both mentally and physically, attempting to restructure their societies that they ruled into utopian societies. This is something regimes in the medieval or pre-modern era like Tsarist Russia or the Austrian Empire had never tried to do. These regimes were more or less tolerant of the peoples they ruled over and basically only demanded their loyalty in times of conflict and tax revenue. Out of the 19th century, four great intellectuals would influence the Cold War. Max Weber, Karl Marx, Emil Durkheim, and Sir Francis Galton. These figures would be influential to the competing ideologies of the early Cold War, namely Marxism, modernization theory, and a pseudo-modernization that was influenced by eugenics. Karl Marx, the father of Marxism, was a German philosopher, economist, sociologist, journalist, and revolutionary socialist. Born in Prussia, he later became stateless and spent much of his life in London. Marx studied at the universities of Bonn and Berlin, where he became interested in the philosophical ideas of the young Hegelians. After college, he became involved with some radical newspapers in Cologne and in Paris, and worked on his material conception of history. After meeting his lifelong friend, Frederick Engels, he moved to London, where he spent the rest of his life. Marx's theories about society, economics, and politics, the collective understanding of which is known as Marxism, holds that human societies progress through class struggle, a conflict between an ownership class that controls production and a dispossessed laboring class that provides labor for production. States Marx believed were run on behalf of this ruling class. He predicted that, like previous socioeconomic systems, capitalism produced internal tensions which would lead to its self-destruction and replacement by a new system, socialism. He argued that class antagonism under capitalism between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat would lead to a, a, the working class conquest of political power and eventually establishing a classless society known as communism, a society governed by a free association of producers. Marx 
actively fought for the implementation of socialism, arguing that the working class should carry out organized revolutionary action to topple capitalism and bring about socioeconomic change. Clearly, Marxist thought became influential during the Cold War, as it was the guiding philosophy for the communist bloc nations, the Soviet Union, and China. Marxism also played a critical role in the revolutionary struggles of the developing world in places like Cuba, Vietnam, and Angola, as well as playing a major role in left-wing politics of the developed world in revolutionary movements such as the Black Panthers, Red Army Faction, and the Weathermen. Max Weber and Emil Durkheim would both influence modernity and, and specifically modernization theory in their own way. Max Weber was a famous German philosopher and political economist who lived from 1864 to 1920. He helped to write the Constitution for the Weimar Republic. In his famous work, The Protestant Work Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, he emphasized the belief that societies, and by extension states, were shaped by culture and ideology, in this case religion, which shaped the way its people thought and acted which is in contrast to Marx's ideas of historical materialism shaping societies and peoples. Marx believed that society was shaped by economics, whereas Weber believed society and the economy was shaped by culture and ideas. Weber's ideas would become influential in the Cold War as they would influence aspects of modernization theory, which I will outline in a moment. The next figure, Emil Durkheim, was a French sociologist, social psychologist, and philosopher. Durkheim's work was concerned with how societies could maintain their integrity and coherence in modernity, an era in which traditional social and religious ties are no longer assumed and in which new social institutions have come into being. Like Weber, Durkheim focused on how religious differences between societies shape their organizational structures. Durkheim also began the process of examining developing societies in contrast to industrialized societies as outlined in his 1912 study, the elementary forms of the religious life. Durkheim's work would influence the rise of modernization theory, which would become the dominant theory around social development in American universities and intellectual circles throughout the 1950s and 1960s. Modernization theory was the dominant intellectual construct by which U.S. government officials, academics, and elites approached the Cold War, especially in regards to the developing world where much of the struggle took place. This theory would be critical in, shape, in the shaping of the Cold War and will be reviewed deeper in a future episode, along with Marxism. But basically, modernization theory defined who was and who was not modern and how societies became modern. Modernization theory saw society developing in five stages. The first stage was traditional society, characterized by subsistence agriculture or hunting and gathering, with limited technology. They have a static or rigid society lacking class or individual economic mobility with stability prioritized and change seen negatively. Think of the Plains Native Americans or African tribes in the early 19th century. The second stage is preconditions for takeoff. During this stage, external demand for raw materials initiates economic change. Industrialized nations need their resources. For this, a good example is Saudi Arabia, which had a lot of oil but few cars and a small industrial base. America and Great Britain were very interested in Saudi oil. Another element is the development of more productive commercial agriculture and cash crops, not consumed by producers and or largely exported. Think the American South and King Cotton being exported to British mills in the mid-19th century. This stage also includes widespread and enhanced investment in change to physical environment to expand production, such as irrigation, canals, ports, roads, etc. This stage also witnesses increasing spread of technology and advances in existing technologies. So think of things like telegrams or how smartphone usage is growing in places like India or Africa. Another aspect of this stage is changing social structure with previous social equilibrium now in flux. Individual social mobility begins and specialization starts. New professions emerge such as sailors, blacksmiths, typists, etc. versus the old roles of laborer, hunter, or farmer, which were the roles uh, available to the vast majority of people. This stage also sees the development of a national identity and shared economic interests via a national army and newspapers. For this, think of France. The French schools, the, the army, roads and railroads, and the press help to create the current state of France versus medieval France with its decentralized feudal kingdom, which spoke a number of different French dialects. The third stage was takeoff. 
In this stage, urbanization increases, industrialization proceeds, more technological breakthroughs occur. Think of late 19th century America with inventors like Thomas Edison. Also, the secondary goods producing sector expands and the ratio of secondary versus primary goods in the economy shifts quickly towards secondary. Basically, think of all the stuff that people buy but don't really need. So it's soap production versus toy production. The society produces, for example, 10,000 bars of soap versus 40,000 toy trains. Textiles and apparel are usually the first takeoff industries, as happened in Great Britain's classical industrial revolution. The fourth stage is the drive to maturity. During this stage, diversification of the industrial base begins. Multiple industries expand, and new ones take root quickly, like steel mills, railroads, refineries, shipyards, etc. Manufacturing shifts from investment-driven capital goods, like steel for buildings and bridges, towards consumer durables, like TVs and cars for domestic consumption. During this stage, we also see rapid development of transportation infrastructure, like airports and railroads, and large-scale investments in social infrastructure, like schools, universities, hospitals, etc., so for this, the perfect example is current-day China. The final stage is the age of mass consumption. At this point, the industrial base dominates the economy. The production of primary goods is greatly diminished in the economy and society, so we have very few highly productive farmers but a millions of service workers. During this stage, widespread and normative consumption of high-value consumer goods increases, such as automobiles, TVs, iPhones, etc., in this stage, consumers typically have disposable income beyond all basic needs for additional goods. This stage also saw the development of a social safety net and the existence of a welfare state for those who can't support themselves. I know this is uh, very different from today's system, of which is a neoclassical economics in which well the welfare state is seen by many as a negative and has been scaled back since the 1980s. Another element of this stage is the election of elites via democracy to lead the nation, while society and the economy are managed via a technocratic bureaucracy. The people chose the leaders, and the technocrats advise the leaders and run the day-to-day -day society. They believed at this stage most people should have very little interest in politics because their material needs were met and people were made content with entertainment like televised football games, Disneyland, Hollywood, etc., Many people might be asking if there was a proposed six-stage development. The designer of this system, or scale, Walter Rostow, believed that there might be, but he didn't know what that will look like. So for our purposes, the system ends at the fifth stage. Essentially, if anyone is familiar with the PC game, Civilization, the game uses the same basic theory. It should be pointed out that the obvious failures of this theory, namely its European or West, Western ethnocentrism, Again, I will talk more about modernization theory in a future episode. Finally, eugenics was a theory that informed many people's vision of modernity during the Cold War. Although racism existed before the development of eugenics, racism was legitimized and given scientific credence through the development of eugenics. In the modern world, science and rationalism became the standard by which a decision or policy was judged to be correct or justified, and eugenics gave racism a legitimacy it did not enjoy under Marxism or modernization theory. Sir Francis Galton, the father of eugenics, was an English Victorian statistician, progressive, sociologist, psychologist, anthropologist, eugenicist, tropical explorer, geographer, inventor, meteorologist, protogenicist and cousin of the famed Charles Darwin, quite the resume. Galton devoted much of his life to exploring variations in human populations and its implications, at which Darwin had only hinted. In doing so, he established a research program which embraced multiple aspects of human variation, from mental characteristics to height, from facial images to fingerprint patterns. This required inventing novel measures of traits, uh, devising large-scale collections of data using those measures, and in the end, the discovery of new statistical techniques for describing and understanding the data. He was a pioneer in eugenics, coining the term itself and the phrase nature versus nurture. His book, Hereditary Genius, in 1869, was the first social scientific attempt to study genius and greatness. These ideas around eugenics would become the scientific basis of the racism in many European states and in the United States. 
These conceptions would culminate in the Third Reich, which was philosophically built around the principles of racial struggle and genetic purity. The Third Reich and the Second World War ultimately helped to shape the geopolitical circumstances and the ideological atmosphere of the Cold War period. Moreover, the end of the Second World War didn't end racism or certain people's beliefs in eugenics. The American South, South Africa, and Rhodesia retained white regimes who actively suppressed black rights based on conceptions of race. These societies and groups had a different perception of modernity and would play a significant role in the Cold War, despite it being a minor force in comparison to Marxism or modernization theory. Moving forward, these three visions of modernity will form the basis of our conversations and the primary building blocks by which we will look at visions around modernity, say in the late British Empire or in the developing world. Of course, the period of the Cold War wasn't the only period that saw different forms of ideology dominate human society. What made the Cold War different and spurred conflict is that each side rejected the other's approach to modernization and saw their own example as the only correct form of modernity. The West saw the Soviet Union and Marxism as a retarded form of modernity. They saw the Soviet Union as a society that was holding back the final stage of modernity, mass consumption, and the benefits of a free market in favor of military arms and eventually their perceived hope of world domination. Whereas the Soviet Union saw the United States as a society that was becoming fascist. The Soviets believed that democratic capitalist countries faced the danger of becoming fascist as Germany and Italy had become if workers or a revolutionary vanguard was unable to take control and reactionary forces were able to take capture the country. Because the United States and the Soviet Union didn't want to engage in a direct war, though the possibility always existed, the conflict moved into other arenas, first to Europe and Northern Asia, and eventually spreading to the former colonial European empires and the developing world. Thus, both saw the spread of the other's ideology as a blow to their own standing and the spread of a malignant cancer in the world. Both sides would also wage a war of propaganda and technological development to prove to their own people and the rest of the world that their economic and social system was superior to that of their competitor. Both the U.S. and the USSR believed that history was on their side, though. They believed that in the long arch of history, their system would be, was superior and would prevail. The U.S. believed that the Soviet system would fail and a democratic and market-driven economy would come to the Soviet Union. The Soviets, in contrast, believed that capitalist forces running the United States would eventually run the society into the ground, leading to its collapse, and the workers and the people would take control of the state. They both believed that it might take 50 to 100 years, but the outcome was inevitable. Two other elements that greatly affected the Cold War from a mental perspective but weren't per se ideologies were the Great Depression and the Second World War. The Great Depression led many to doubt both democracy and capitalism, especially in the West. Many came to see these systems as non-efficient and in many ways unmodern and outdated holdovers from the 18th century. Therefore, many people experiencing the political and economic crisis of the 1920s and 30s saw communism as an alternative form of organizing society, since they believed with capitalism's inequalities, booms, and busts, it was an inefficient way to organize the economy. Many in the West also were afraid that young democracies couldn't stand up to socialist states, local communists, or the Soviet Union, and that the United States was better off backing dictatorships in the Cold War struggle because of their experience in the 1920s and 30s. They argued only dictatorships like fascist Italy and Spain had been successful in standing up to local communists. Additionally, in the West, especially America, it was believed that the Great Depression caused a breakdown of the global financial system, which led to an end of free trade, which resulted in further economic hardships as states established tariffs and trading blocks, which led to political instability and radicals coming to power in Germany, Italy, and Japan. Therefore, many in the West believed that free trade and open markets had to be maintained to ward off the danger of depression and political radicalism. Finally, World War II had a huge impact on the conflict, psychologically speaking, into the 1980s. Both populations, American and Soviet, were traumatized by the war and did not want to fight another world war. That being said, many people on both sides had a foreboding feeling that it might be inevitable. Both the U.S. and the USSR rejected the political order of the pre-war world. They both initially rejected the European colonial empires and the balance of power politics that had governed the period. 
The U.S. eventually came to have a softer line on European colonies as the Cold War progressed, and both sides came to accept aspects of the balance of power when it fit their purposes. For the West, a big issue was the Munich Agreement. After the war, many Western Cold War leaders saw it as the decisive moment where Allied strength might have, st- might have stopped Hitler and the Second World War. The belief being that if Neville Chamberlain had been willing to go to war over the Sudetenland, Hitler would have backed down and World War II might have been avoided. Thus, Western Cold War leaders were determined to not back down in the face of future intimidation. A common fear to come out of World War II for both the United States and the Soviet Union was surprise attack. Both the Soviet Union and the U.S. had been brought into World War II via a surprise attack. They were both not prepared for and both suffered heavy losses because of it. So during the Cold War, both sides were determined not to be caught off guard again, especially as the danger of nuclear weapons grew. As the old saying goes, generals are always fighting the last war, and the Cold War was no exception. Both sides' militaries extensively studied the Second World War as it influenced their tactics and strategies. For example, the Soviets focused on tank technology and mass mechanized formations, which had secured victory for them in the Second World War. The United States, in contrast, would spend billions on supercarriers and long-range bombers, weapons which had helped them to defeat Japan and Germany in the Second World War. I want to thank you for listening to the History of the Cold War podcast, Episode 1, The Ideological Roots of the Cold War. Make sure you check out Episode 2, The Geopolitical Roots of the Cold War, and make sure you visit our website at www.historyofthecoldwarpodcast.com, one word, to see our latest episodes and to follow us on Twitter and like our Facebook page for all of our latest episodes and Cold War content.